A lot of what I've got to say tonight is going to echo exactly what Brother Jill's been preaching and he's been teaching on. I couldn't get away from this lesson. I, I came back to it, but I'm going to read the first four verses out of the first chapter of the book of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may perfect and entire wanting nothing. I want to look at the book of James tonight for a little bit, and it talks about our faith, it talks about our works, and it talks about that we as a Christian, the way that we should conduct ourselves, Sister Maria. Most Bible scholars, when you, when you, when you study this, agree that James, which was the brother of Jesus, wrote the general epistle of James. It talks about him in Matthew 13 and 55 and Mark 6 and 3. Uh, Galatians 1 and 19 about James being the brother of Jesus Christ. And he was one of the leaders of the church at Jerusalem during Paul's ministry, Brother Johnny. <clears throat> and he opens the letter by identifying himself as James. And then he calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now looking at that, that, that word, the Greek word for servant used here is doulos. It's D-O-U. L-O-S, and it's meaning a bondman or a slave. That means that the master has complete control of the slave who is totally submissive to him. And when you look at that word bondman, Brother Jill, it means that it's someone that at one point has been set free from their duties as a slave, but yet they have chosen to go on and be a servant to whoever they are with. Right. They've made that choice that, I'm still going to be a servant, but it's going to be of my own free accord, if you will. But he's totally submissive to him, Sister Eloise. I know the picture that you and I often get when we think about someone that's a slave. We think about someone that's been beaten. We think about someone that's been whipped uh, by its master, someone that someone has been cruel to. And that's the image that we get when we think about the word slave. But James is saying in this passage that he has willingly given himself over and under to the control of God Almighty for the purpose of spreading the gospel. I'm going to be a servant, but it's on my own accord. I'm willingly doing this to spread the gospel of God's message. He's chosen to give himself over, Brother Billy, of his own free will, if you will. And you, you read about different things. Paul, is, he calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ to the Gentile nation. And he speaks about in 1 Corinthians 19, 16 through 27. And brother, brother Shannon, I don't have this in there. I'm going to kind of paraphrase about some of this, about preaching the gospel to other people. Now, we know that Paul was the apostle to the Gentile nation. Right. God called him to take this gospel to you and I. We're Gentiles here tonight. Sure. And God had called him to spread this gospel to the Gentile nation. And Paul says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. I've got really nothing to glory. I've got nothing to brag about. For the necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe. And that word woe right there means grief or it means uh, misery, if you will, is unto me if I preach not the gospel. If I don't take this word that God has given to me and uh, re made me responsible for, then woe is unto me. There's going to be trouble come my way if I can't take this message and spread it across this world. And we know that Paul... Paul just turned his world upside down in the day and age that he lived in. Right. Well, all the churches that he, that, he, that he started, he wrote 13 of the 27 of the New Testament books. Paul turned his world upside down. Right. But he felt the necessity to do that because if he, if he didn't, he was afraid of what was going to happen to him. He said, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will... A dispensation, and that dispensation that he's talking about there is the Gentile nation. It's you and I. A dispensation of the gospel, the time of gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? He says, verily, which means truly, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. This gospel that we have is at no cost to you. He paid the price at Calvary when he died for us. It's made at no cost to you. That I abuse not my power in the gospel, for though I be free from all men, there's nobody making me do this, Paul's saying. There's nobody forcing me to do this, 
yet I have made myself servant unto all that I may gain the more. Paul suffered a lot. Five times he was whipped with a cat of nine tails. Three times he was beaten with a rod. He was stoned and left dead. He said he suffered shipwreck, a day and a night in the deep. Many, many things that Paul went to went through in his life to spread this gospel message. I begin, to, I begin to think about that. I begin to think about Paul, and you think about those beatings that he took, what his body must have looked like, how he must have been racked in pain, but there was something, Brother Billy, that said, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. I'm going to preach this gospel no matter what I have to go through, no matter what I have to face. I'm going to preach this gospel. When we talk about being a servant unto God, it speaks of five things. The first is absolute obedience toward God. To be obedient to the calling is what Apostle Paul said at one time, to be obedient to the calling towards God. Absolute humility, to be humble. Absolute loyalty toward God. A, a certain pride. And what that means, that I'm serving God Almighty, I've got a pride in Him right. Right. of who I'm serving. Yes. The creator of the universe, right. the God of everything, that's who I'm serving. But in the other hand, you're either going to serve God or you're going to serve mammon. You're going to serve God or you're going to serve the world. And I take a certain pride in serving God. There was a lot of servants spoken of in the Old Testament. There was Moses, uh, Joshua, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets it talks about. But also, the fifth thing is absolute dependence upon the master. I'm looking for him to take care of me. And knowing, Brother Jill, that he's going to because he's proven it to me time and time and time again. Amen? He's proven it to me over and over and over again. So I've got that dependence upon God. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Believe on him. Believe on him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 in the book that, I, that I've been mentioning about, Brother Jeff Arnold talks about God's building himself a house. He said God will not live in a run-down shack. Right. Right. Now, you've got to know Brother Jeff Arnold to un- understand his terminology. He, calls, he says nick and poop and all kinds of stuff in the book, but it's just his way of preaching. But he says God's not going to live in a run-down shack. When God moves in, things are going to be being, begin to be fixed up just a little bit. He's going to begin to make changes in our life that's pleasing unto him. Amen? That's what God does when he moves into our lives. He makes those changes for us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? And that word temple there means a sacred place. It means it's a consecrated place of the Holy Ghost. It's God's Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify. That means to give honor and praise to God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This body is flesh. Give God the glory of it. Give God glory in it and in your spirit, which are of God's. It's not your own. It belongs to God when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Our walk with God or our calling with God makes us servants to God. We're all a servant to God, Brother Booby. To be used of him in whatever manner he chooses to use us in. It's a position of honor. It's not a position to be degrading. It's a position of honor to be able to serve God and to do his will. James addresses this letter to the 12 tribes which had been scattered at that time abroad, possibly due to persecution. They've been driven away from their homes. They've been driven away from their lifestyles. They've been driven away from their churches that they were accustomed to. And now they were living in foreign lands and among people that did not live and believe or worship as they did. And the context of the next few verses speaks to the people about the things which they would have to endure and go through, which is much of the same things that you and I have to deal with in the world that we live in. We live in in a cruel world. We live in a world that's been racked by sin. It's not a pleasant place to live in sometimes. But... Brother Jill, Titus 2 and 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The day and age that we live in right now, the time that we live in right now, it can be done. 
Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, he says, For Demoth hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He walked with Paul for a while, but there was something, Brother Doyle, that drawed him back. And he says, he's left me having loved this present world, the day and age that he lived in. There was something about it that had a hold on him. 1 John 5 and 4 tells us, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, even our faith. James 4 and 4 even tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And that word enmity means hatred. It's hatred against God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. If you're going to be a friend of the world, you're going to hate God. It's what, it's what it speaks about. James, James is letting his Jewish brothers know he's concerned about them and the situations they're going to be facing in their life. Brother Shannon, go back to verse 2, if you will, James 4 and 2. Let's look at verse 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Now, Brother Gio made mention of this the other night. One of the most difficult areas for us to understand and for us to comprehend as a Christian is the matter of testing and trials that we have to endure or go through. I'm not standing up here telling you that I don't, and I haven't done it because I have. We want to know why. We want to know how come we're having to go through this at this time. And, and a lot of the lessons I know I've taught is focused on this. It's, it's possibly because of some of the things that I go through or maybe God's speaking to all of us here tonight. James brings these things out to us in this passage. Everyone will at different times of their lives encounter a trial or a problem. Just get ready. If you haven't, you will. It's coming. And we struggle with it, wanting to know why. We'll encounter a trial or a problem. It doesn't matter if we're living for God or if not. It rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. Life just happens. How many of you know that's a fact? Life just happens. It's just, it's just the way it is. But the only comfort that you and I have in living for God is that when these things take place, we've got him to call on. We've got him to trust in. We've got him to depend on. Yeah. Right. Right. Totally dependent upon God. Yeah. Jesus, ex- Jesus himself experienced trouble and warned his disciples to expect tribulation in the world. John 16 and 33 says, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've overcome it. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8, he says that he was troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Troubles and trials are just a way of life. You get too many amens, but that's a fact. It's just a way of life. It's just, it's just the way it is. And we're, we're not alone when we experience them. Think about it like this. When you, when you think about a trial and you think about a test, you think about the pressure. You think about the pressure that you're under, Sister Judy. And pressure, pressure does two things when you, when you look at it. It reveals character, which is a quality or trait that distinguishes an individual. Or it produces character, good or bad. Pressure does two things. It reveals character, a quality or trait that distinguishes an individual. Or it produces a character, which is good or or bad. Now, a jeweler gives what is called a water test as a way of identifying a true diamond. An imitation diamond is uh, an imitation stone is never as brilliant as the genuine stones, but sometimes the difference can be, can't be determined by simply looking at it. You know, you got a diamond, you got a cubic cubic zirconia, you got two different ones, but sometimes the difference can't be determined by simply just looking at it, brother Gio. So a jeweler knows what a genuine, they take that genuine diamond and they place it in water. And that genuine diamond will sparkle brilliantly. It'll just shine just like it was if it's on your finger in the sunlight underwater. But you take that imitation and you put it underwater and it doesn't sparkle. It doesn't shine. They call it the water test. The water test makes picking the real diamond very easy. And by the same analogy... When we're going through a trial, our faith in God will be revealed or it's going to be extinguished. 
It's either going to be revealed or it's going to be extinguished or put out. The Lord tells the church of Smyrna. It was one of the two good churches in the book of Revelation, uh, uh, Philadelphia being the other one. He tells Smyrna, he said, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. You're going to suffer and you're going to go through some things, but don't fear none of them. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation for ten days. And there's a period of ten years that, that, that they went through, if you will look at it like that, perils of persecution. But he says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. There's a reward coming, but you're going to have to go through some trials and tests. There's a better day coming. There's a better place coming, but you're going to have to go through some trials and tests in your life. There will be times our faith is tested. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and ensueth evil. That means he shunned evil. The Lord God Almighty asked Satan that. Have you considered my servant Job? I got a little bit of faith in this boy right here. I don't want to go, I don't want to go through anything Job went through, nothing like it. But then again, I wish the Lord would, I guess, Brother Booby had the faith in me, amen? You look at, it, look at it different ways, but Job went through some things in his life. James says if your faith is genuine, that it will prove itself in a time of trouble. James says count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. And that word count means to regard or look upon these things in a certain light, to consider or evaluate them. Count it. Look at, look at it when you fall in these different temptations, these different trials. One writer says to look at these trials from the perspective of eternity. When I go through them, I'm thinking about eternity. They may be temporary to us in our lives, but they will reap, reap great rewards for us in the time to come. It will be a conscious commitment for us to have a joyous attitude when we're going through a trial and we're going through tribulation. Well, Johnny, we've got to make our mind up whether it's going to happen like that. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit. I talked about the true vine. John chapter 15 speaks about true vine. But you've got to be tapped into that power source. You've got to be tapped into God Almighty. Joy is produced in our life. Jesus says in John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, and your joy might be full. The Greek word used for joy is chara, C-H-A-R-A, which means gladness or delight, and is used 60 times in the New Testament. The verb form of that, char or charin, means to rejoice. We are told throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament to rejoice or delight in the Lord. That means when you, mean, when you rejoice, you do it over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, right. over and over and over again. He goes on to say that whatever state that he has found himself in, he's learned to be content. I'm talking about Apostle Paul again, all the troubles and trials that he went through, the tribulation that he went through. He had disciplined himself to accept whatever that he faced in life. James used the word when and not if. When you go through these things, when you face these things, when you face these tests or face these per perse persecution, whenever trials and tests come their way, they will happen. They will happen. They will take place. James goes on to say when you fall, a possibility that when you fall, that Greek word used there is parapetos, and it means to stumble. When you fall or when you stumble into divers, and that means a different, a various uh, a diversity and not the number of temptations, which translates to trials and refers to that which breaks the pattern of tranquility or happiness. And that's usually the way that storms and trials come our way or persecution and test comes our way. Everything's going fine in our life. And then, bam, it hits. It, it's there, and we don't, we don't know what... What, what happens, our world shattered and we're surrounded by turmoil. James doesn't specify what trials he had in mind, but his instructions is applicable to any trial we face in our life. The trial is not necessarily an invitation for us to give into it in sin. It's not an invitation for us to give into it in sin, but 
Actually, it's an opportunity for us to strengthen our faith in God. The word paramosis means to put the test. Regardless of whether the results of the testing are positive or negative, trials test our faith. We either pass or fail to fail the test by wrongly responding to it allows it to become a temptation to us. If it causes us to stumble and has proven to be successful in tempting us, if it ends up in victory, we overcome it and it's been successful for the jail and strengthen us and strengthen us in our walk with God. Trials will affect us in three ways. They're going to affect us physically, they'll affect us mentally, and they will affect us spiritually. They come in forms of disappointment, frustration, loneliness, misunderstanding, unfulfilled dreams, unmet unmet expectations, lost, fear, criticism, persecution, and conflict. And I I want you to know I'm not bringing a message of doom tonight. This is not a message of doom, but this is to let you know that we've got God on our side, that God is for us. But we've got to have the faith to trust in him when these things happen in our life. (coughs) Excuse me. True, genuine faith in God is born and shown through the trials that we go through. It leads us to a place that we fall on our face before God and we seek God in prayer, learning and leaning on the strength of God in our time of weakness. Verse 3 says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. How many of you have prayed for patience? <laughs> to get patience, you've got to go through something in your life. Amen. To know is to have an understanding, a mind of what's happening in our lives. Knowing this, that the trying of our faith worketh patience. There's not a one of us here that has not faced a trial or test in our life. We all have personal knowledge and experience of what takes place, and we know what's going on to take on our part and make it through. The trying of our faith is the testing of the trial we are facing. The scripture says that it worketh patience. Patience, Brother Booby, is long-suffering, which is another fruit of the Spirit. One writer said long-suffering is the quality of self-restraint, being able to control yourself in the face of a problem or situation in which you should not hastily retaliate, to have that self-restraint, if you will, that long-suffering. I I see it as a Christian having the ability with God on their side to withstand anything that comes up against us. And that does not always mean that God's going to deliver us from our problems. Well, Billy, it doesn't always mean that he's going to make a way of escape. But we have the assurance in knowing that he'll be right there with us all the way through it. That he'll be with us all the way through it. Long-suffering comes from a, from a Greek word meaning forbearance or restraint, patience, uh, long-tempered. Webster's Dictionary defines long-suffering as patiently enduring, lasting offense or hardship. And it defines the word patient as bearing pains or trials calmly without complaint which is hard for us to do, manifesting forbearance or refrain under provocation, enticement or strain, the ability to be able to bear or withstand. The importance of long-suffering or patience in our life is just not the trials we face, but how we respond to the trials and tests. Because the opposite of patience, if we don't have patience, Sister Eloise, then impatience steps in. We're showing that we really don't have 100% faith in God, Brother Johnny, if we're impatient. It shows us that we see God to be opposite of who and what he really is. If we do not see him as being omnipotent, which is all-powerful, omniscient, which is all-knowing, or omnipresent, which means it's presence everywhere. We've got to learn to trust and put our faith in God. I don't want to embarrass my wife. I talked about going through tests and going through trials. We've been through some stuff in our life. God, God has always been there, and He's always He's always stood with us. You know, I, 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 we've had to file bankruptcy. We we've lost, we lost our home, we lost our vehicle. But you know what? I didn't go on the street one night. I moved from one house to the next. 
I bought me a, God made a way for Sister Sharon and I to buy a 2011 model Chevy Impala, two or three years newer than what we already had. Matter of fact, when I moved out of my house, Brother Jill, the people that were hurrying me to move out of my house, they gave me $1,000 just to hurry and get out of the house. You know, I'm talking about the blessings of God. Now, I'm just being honest and real in where we live at tonight. I'm talking about what I know in my own life and what I faced in my own life, and I know what God can do. I didn't understand it. Didn't make sense. But God's always been there. He's always been there. The Greek philosopher Aristotle said that patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. The fruit is the evidence or the result of what we've been through or what we've gone through. Galatians 6 and 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we don't give in, we're going to reap. We're going to, there's going to be a benefit that takes place. Long-suffering shows the character of who we are and what's really on the inside of us. Verse 4 sums it up. It says, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let's look at it like this. Let patience have her perfect work. Let God do his work in your life. Let God do his work in your life. Let endurance do what God wants it to do. A command for us as a Christian to be submissive to our trials and tests. Don't fight or argue with it about it. Don't take our frustrations out on God. Simply learn from it and move on. And I know that's easier than, than it sounds, but that's what it's all about. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There had no temptation taking you, but as such is common to man. Everybody's gone through it. Everybody's faced it. But God is faithful who will suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with temptation always make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. He will not put no more on you than you can bear. He will not put no more on us, Brother Terry, than we can go through or that we can endure. There's always a better way. The only way out of our trial and test is trusting in God Almighty who's faithful to us. Perfect work is for us to be spiritually mature in God, a full-grown Christian, if you will. Romans 5, 1 through 5 says, Therefore, being justified... By faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Now, this lesson speaks to us about trials and tests that we faced in life. If we allow them to, it will build our faith in God because it's during these times in our life we have to make a choice to fully trust and believe in God so that we can mature in our walk with Him. First, first Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. He said rejoice. That, that word re means over and over again. If you place a pot of water over an open flame and the water begins to boil, it will evaporate and disappear. But if the, if the pot's not refilled, it's going to evaporate. That way you've got to fill it over and over again so that it will not burn. We've got to rejoice. We've got to refill ourselves in the Holy Ghost time and time and time again. Amen. Amen. Psalms 121 and 1 says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. I know that my help comes from God. Yes, sir. You sure can, brother. Uh huh. Amen. 
That's right. That's true. That's an awesome point, Brother Billy. That is an awesome point. We know that God heals. We know that he delivers. We know that he restores. We know all things are possible with God. But as I said, there's times when he chooses not to change the situation of our life. The Apostle Paul had the thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times for the Lord to remove it, but he told him, he said, you're made perfect in your weakness. When I'm weak, then am I strong because God is taking care of us. God's taking care of us. Isaiah 48 and 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. To afflict means to grieve or to distress. It means disappointments and trials and tribulations in our life. But it's during these times in our life that God is proving us. God forges his character into our lives by fire to be able to unleash his power in our lives. David says in... Go ahead, brother. I'd like to add something kind of what you just said and, and tie it in with Brother Billy. We, and, and you just read that, that's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. He said, I've chosen mm-hmm. you in the furnace of your affliction. Okay? We think that before God can use us, we've got to get through our trial. Mm-hmm. Before God can bless us, I've got to come through it. That scripture says he's willing to use me. That's again the, the wisdom of God, God. foolishness to the man. world. But right. the key is, Brother David, the key is the first thing every Christian should do, every Holy Ghost filled person, because to try to win this battle without the Holy Ghost is destined for failure. Right. Amen. You will not be able to do these things that you're speaking. And I believe every one of us. Right. But the Bible says, Greater is he that is in me. Than he that is in the world. Than he that's in the world. I've got to have the spirit of God within me. Amen. And the first thing i got to realize is I can't make it by myself. Nope. So there has to be that realization. I need the Holy Ghost right. first. I need the spirit. Amen. Then. This stuff, there's no doubt who the winner is. Right. It's just a matter of when Amen. I Amen. Just as sure as when I fall, I, I will win. Right. You I shall arise. Just as right. sure, not because of who I am. Right. But because of who I've got in me. Amen. Mm-hmm. Don't go find somebody to talk to. Right. Don't uh, go on a vacation. <laughs> you know, don't go to the bank and borrow a bunch of money to get away from your problem. That's one of the most foolish things I've ever seen people do in my life is be going through a trial as an excuse to go borrow $5,000 to go to Florida. Like it's going to go away. Right. You know, the first thing you do when you begin to face opposition is make sure you're full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pray through, pray through till you talk in tongues. Pray right. through. There's that. And then it's going to all be good. Amen. Because it's the Spirit. The Spirit. That's, that's who's going to carry me through mm-hmm. is the Spirit of God. That's right. And, and your commitment's not strong enough to take you through every trial just, just because you're a good person. Right. Just because you're a good fellow. Just because uh-huh. you show up to church. You right. Got to you have, have the Holy Ghost. Ghost. Right. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's exactly that's exactly right. David says in Psalm sixty six, ten through twelve, he says, For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast caused men to ride over our head. We went through fire and water, but thou brought us out into a wealthy place. Notice who David said, God allowed this thing to happen to him. It was God also that brought him out into a wealthy place. God allowed it to happen, but then God brought him out. God's there all the time. Is it all right if I let somebody know that night that God's on your side? God is on your side. I don't know what you're facing, what you're going through, but I know that he will be an ever-present help in a time of trouble, that he will always be there. I believe, I believe Brother Jill, the answer to us finding the answer to this is in Psalm 73. Asaph, which was David's chief, chief musician, 
He was from the Levite tribe, which means that he was a priest. It was his duty to worship God in music and his song. And I, I believe I read somewhere that he wrote 12 of the Psalms. He starts out Psalm 73 and 1 by saying, Truly, God is good to Israel, and even to such are of a clean heart. But then he makes a, a pretty bold statement in verses 2 and 3. He said, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. God's good. He's good, even to those that are of a clean heart. But when I looked around and I saw everybody else prospering, these evil people, these people that weren't living right, you're right, Brother Jill, made me want to give up. He said, my feet well and I slipped. He begins to speak about how the wicked men did not have trouble or problems, nor were they plagued or had problems as others. Their eyes stood out with fatness. They were blessed beyond measure, if you will. They speak corruptly and wickedly. They are ungodly and they prosper in the world and they increase in riches. But Pete, Asaph couldn't understand this. Asaph said, I've cleansed my heart and washed his hands. But he had been plagued or he'd been troubled all day long and chastened every morning. And that it was very painful to him. He was having a hard time dealing with this. He was having a hard time understanding the fact that he's trying to live right and he's trying to do right and all he had in his life were problems after problems after problems. This guy was a priest of the tribe of Levi. And he writes these words. It seems familiar to us. It sounds familiar to us in our own life. We have a hard time wondering, why is it that everyone else is doing great? These people that not even claiming to live for God are prospering. They're, 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 going, they're getting everything that they want. And yet, Brother Johnny, I'm struggling. I don't understand it. But there comes a time in Asaph's life when he begins to see things just a little clearer. Brother Shannon, give me verse 17. Brother Gilles used this scripture many, many a time. He said, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. He began to see things a little clearly and a little differently, if you will, when he went into the house of God. Until he got into the presence of the house of God. Until he began to hear the preaching of the word of God. Things began to change. He began to see things a little clearly, begin to see things a little differently. He had a different perspective about what was going on. He said, until I went into the sanctuary of God. By prayer and worship in the sanctuary, he understood that God was the center of all things. It was here that he received an understanding of what was going to take place to these people. It's at church, in the presence of God, that we begin to see things clearly and understand that God is on our side. It's here. This is where we get our strength at. This is where we need to come to when we need to have our vision changed about what's going on in our life. Right here in the house of God. To know, Brother Shannon, God's on our side. His ears are tuned to our cries. He's watching over us and he cares for us. Asaph ends in Psalm 73, 28. By saying, but it's good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may, may declare all thy works. Our circumstances may be so big sometimes that we can't see around them, but we should never forget that some men will only receive a reward in this life, but we've got a better place and a better time coming. There's a better place and a better time coming if we keep our trust in God. If we stay full of the Holy Ghost, and we stay on fire for God, there's a better time coming for us. Will you, will you stand with me? I'm going to get ready to turn it back to Brother GL.